Frank Graves, you gave a very interesting and wide-ranging talk this morning to the Canada 2020 conference on the views of Canadians and suggested a, a, a wave towards the progressive side of the spectrum. But I want to ask you first about one element of that. And that's the view of Canadians on the international sphere, where Canada should be in the world. I asked specifically because Liberal leader Justin Trudeau you know, waded into that in the context of Iraq and Syria this morning. How do you think people's views of the place of Canada will have changed and what are the sort of salient factors we should be aware of on that? Well, it's, it's, it's definitely in flux and attitudes to the external world and how we should be dealing with it have been changing quite a, quite a bit in this century mm -hmm. uh, and all that uh, changed in a whiplash-like fashion following September 11th where the real focus was on security to a degree that we'd never seen it before. We've seen that that security ethic which gripped Canadians as and Americans in a kind of upper North American unity has relaxed its hold uh, and is now being replaced by a view that while security is important, you know, maybe some of that almost obsessive focus on security has not necessarily insulated us from zero risk or made us risk free, but it's also cost us a lot of our uh, core values such as civil liberties, freedom, mm -hmm. maybe even our economy has been mired down uh, as we've been, uh, uh, you know, focused on these issues. So we see that. Canadians are showing considerably less uh, focus on issues of security than they did in the past and saying maybe we should be returning to some of the foreign policy toolkit that worked for us so well in the past. Such as? Uh, such as, for example, Canadians nostalgically remember the period where Canada was known, more known as peacekeepers rather than peacemakers. They also know that some of our really salient contributions in the, on the world stage have not been as sort of smaller versions of American military muscle, but as diplomats mm -hmm. or experts in development and aid. And so when you think about the array of the three Ds that we used to talk about, defense, diplomacy, and uh, development. development, yeah, the, <laughs> the development, yeah. which also I think includes trade now in, in the Canadian mindset, yeah. then, then I think they're saying we'd like to rebalance things, you know, that this uh, somewhat more chauvinistic and militaristic period, which did find some favor with Canadians. Canadians were proud of, were, of Afghanistan they, in, many, in many cases. They right were, now. but then in the rear view mirror, decisively, the view now is, well, you know what, uh, I don't think that all those efforts most people say they either move the art sticks backwards, mm. things are actually worse than when we mm. came, which is a tragedy given the human and, and economic costs, or they say we spun our wheels, we really can't detect the difference. Only about 25% of Canadians believe and, and that we've actually made a positive difference for all this massive expenditure that's gone on, and that applies as well to Libya and the view on Iraq where we didn't uh, get involved instructively. Right was that that was not a disaster. The, the, uh, Canadians, so Canadians are happy we weren't in the Yeah, uh, and, and here's the people, when they note this, the fact that Canadians, you know, and our government made this sort of moral uh, uh, decision not to go to Iraq, well, that was partly true, but it's also true that we were polling for the government of the day uh, nightly on that issue, and, mm. and the support for it, which most Canadians supported. Mm. People forget this, the support for going to Iraq was actually decisively in the majority. Really? That's interesting. It, it unraveled basically when the coalition of the willing became a substitute for the aegis of the United Nations. Right. And it came unraveled particularly quickly in Quebec, where military action's always been viewed with more tepid uh, enthusiasm than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. But that was what happened in that time. So we, yes, we made the right decision, but it was guided by both morality and the polls. I, I want to move to some other issues, but before I leave sort of world affairs and Canada's place in the world, do you have any sense of how important it is for Canadians in voting intentions or in their the way they, they see themselves on the ideological spectrum, how, how, how world affairs play into that or do people sort of define themselves more along the axis of, of domestic issues? It's a very good question and there are instances where issues related to world affairs, be they signing a NAFTA agreement or be they, you know, Vietnam or Iraq or other things become extremely important. But for the most part, I think they're an important ingredient of a broader optic mm. that the public have on what the government stands for and how that's conveying Canada to the world and how we feel about ourselves and our role in the world. And it's interesting to note that even though we see some evidence that Canadians are becoming adverse to more military adventure, 
it doesn't mean that they are becoming isolationist or more parochial. Canadians are quite cosmopolitan. They, mm. they think that the world is an, an important uh, arena for Canada, whether we be there as traders or, or in development roles or diplomatic roles, and occasionally in responsibility to protect. It is an important ingredient of how Canadians look. And so it can have an influence on how people will vote, but it's not the ballot booth question. People are not going to go in and say, oh my God, I don't... Who's got the foreign policy I like? Yeah, I yeah, they, there may be occasions where it becomes a ballot booth issue, but I think it's an important ingredient of how people form their choice. Frank, there was a, you talked a bit about issues involving the people's attitudes towards the economy, and specifically whether or not they view them as, themselves as in the middle class or whether they view themselves as, as rising members of the middle class or maybe stagnant or falling members. At McLean's, we've been very interested in this subject, and our writers and some of the economists who write for our website have waded in a lot on the question of what is the real state of the middle class? Are Canadians getting poorer? Yeah. Are they getting richer? But you were suggesting that in a way, at least in, in understanding Canadian politics, those questions about the real state of the middle class matter less than the real attitude of people about their, their position, their security, their, whether they're rising or falling. Can, can yeah. you talk to that? Well, there, like, is that the, there is that, you know, you know kind of real politic uh, idea that it doesn't matter what the numbers show, the official statistics may show this or that, uh, but if the public feel this in their heart of hearts, mm. then it really is and the economy. And what do they feel in their Well, heart I mean, hearts. the numbers couldn't be clearer. And by the way, the official stats, when you parse them properly, show that the public aren't being foolish. Mm. There is stuff going on. And I would take serious issue with some of the more economistic treatments of the numbers that say, oh yes, the, the middle class are doing swimmingly well. Mm. Well, listen, we had uh, upper North America, and Canada and the United States are pretty well the same on this, experienced growth rates in the last 40 years of the 20th century of between four and 5%. And that cumulatively spilled over each year into a better and better economy with more and more money to go around. Uh, what happened since, and uh, ironically, it's basically after September 11th, we see mm. these problems start to occur, we entered an age of stagnation. Hmm. The growth rates of four and five percent have been replaced with growth rates between one and two percent, if you count in the interruptions of the 2008 recession. Not only that, there's been a dramatic shift in the incidence of how those that more tepid growth is distributed, with a much greater fraction going to a much smaller group at the top. So basically, uh, you can say, oh, the middle class is doing really well, but it's hard to, this must defy the laws of economic gravity. Because if you have things growing at 5%, that now grow at 2%, and is being distributed more unequally, how can that possibly be the fuel of a, of a, of a, a better middle class? Okay, so accepting that that's, that's the reality, how is that translating into people's attitudes, and, and well, how important is that in people framing their own sense of you know, where they fit in that well, society? Well, I think the public believe it's a defining issue. I mean, in, the, the, in, in simplest terms, the public feel with a matter of, of conviction and consensus that having a optimistic and growing middle class that's moving forward is an essential precondition for a healthy economy and a, and a, pro, a healthy society. By equally strong consensus, nobody thinks that's happening anymore. Mm -hmm. And I would argue the numbers suggest that when you look at how this is unraveling as you move from seniors who did do quite well to boomers where things are more mixed, to the Gen X and below where, no, it's not working nearly as well. They're not doing better than their parents. You had an interesting statistic. Can you tell me, I don't know if you can call, call, rhyme it off here, having to do with people's view about whether their children or grandchildren yeah, will do it, better than them. Yeah, it's, it's and it, a, well, there, is, there are two statistics I think are really disturbing because this gray outlook on the future where people say, gee, I'm not sure that we're moving ahead like we used to. We always used to do better. You work hard, you know, you, you come up with a better mousetrap, then you're gonna, you know, have the few luxuries, you get a car, you get a house, you do better than your dad or mom, and your kids will do better, and you'll be secure in your retirement. Hmm. People no longer feel that's on. And you know what, some of the evidence suggests they're right. But when you ask people to think about, well, how does this look down the road? Let's go 25 years down the road, which is about a generational lens, 13% of Canadians think the next generation is going to be doing better than this one. 13%. Yeah, it's 9% in the United States, which makes it a little worse, but that's a horrible statistic. Yes. And when we look at the numbers that say, okay, so how are you doing compared to your, your dad in this case? It's a fair technical comparison because if your women worked in the past, and the, you're making more or less money at today than your dad did it when he was your age. Mm. And for seniors, absolutely. Everybody says, I'm doing much better. Only 15% say they're doing worse. Mm. But when we go to uh, the boomers, that number rises to 30. We go to the Gen X and below 45, the number rises up to almost 50. So what you see in a very short period of time is this period where people did do better, 
through hard work and effort is being replaced by an era not only of stagnation, mm -hmm. there's a threefold rise in the rate of intergenerational downward mobility. And the hard evidence when it starts coming in, it takes longer to assemble that than asking people in, in social surveys, is confirming that these trends really are happening. So the people that say this is some kind of an exaggerated illusion, they're, they're just ignoring what the public are experiencing. And, and, and Frank, unlike the, the sort of world picture or candidate in the world picture we discussed earlier, I take it from the way you're discussing that this this is something that could define people's oh, voting intentions, issue. define their, their sense of where they fit in the political Yeah, we ask world. people a straightforward choice. Some people say, that Canada's middle class is, is, is world class and is doing very well and this really is not an issue or the inequality questions that go around. Others say that Canada's middle class is falling backward and pessimistic and it, this is the defining issue of our day. 70-30 is the way that people pick on that question. There's, so for the public, actually it's even stronger, I think mm -hmm. it's more like 75-25. So for the public, you know, which is, it lines up pretty well with the government's constituency versus everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it is a case that the people that are supporting the government, the, the shrinking portion, where last poll had it slightly under 25% for the first time ever, which came out today, uh, feel they are doing well. And they feel they're going to do better in the future. And it, some of the objective evidence is they are. But guess what? For the other three and four Canadians, they're not feeling that mirthful kind of sense of cheer about the economy. They feel they're actually falling backward and they feel the future looks really dark indeed. Wow. And that's really unfortunate because actually Canada has enormous advantages which probably will only get stronger as time goes on because of geopolitical or reorganization around climate change, energy access, uh, uh, movements of populations. The, the, the th we should not be aspiring well, so depending whether you pick IMF or, or CIA or World Bank statistics, we've gone from a first or second in the world in per capita GDP to 11th or 22nd. We should, we should be aiming for number one and not happy, oh, we're on our way to number 35. I mean, that's, that's, and I think that's what the public feel is they want someone to say, we can put a blueprint together here that restarts progress, that makes this middle class miracle of the late 20th century something that's on again. Wow. Very deep stuff. Frank Graves, thank you very much for talking to us. Fascinating. Yeah, my pleasure.